member of the California Arts Council and Beverly Hills Arts Commission, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories can be read in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hi, welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. We love having you out there watching us every week. Our guests today are actor Maxwell Caulfield and artist-actress Mary Warnoff. I first met Maxwell on the set of Grease 2 when I went for Interview Magazine to interview him. Andy said, oh, there's this really, Andy Warhol said, there's this really handsome young actor and we want you to go over and do an interview. I don't remember the year, but he looked like this. <laughs> And like this. <laughs> he was dancing and singing, and he had his own trailer. And I didn't realize what a big deal that was at that time to have your own trailer. Was that your first picture, Max? Yes, it was, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, they, I think they regret having given me my own trailer. They used to have to come and knock on the door numerous times. I was cranking up the who, <laughs> wailing on the walls with my drumsticks, and it all led to this uh, reputation I had for wreaking havoc, totally unjustified. How did you get that, that role? Uh, i tell you how I got it. Um, I was in the classic tradition, uh, discovered uh, off-Broadway in, in New York. By, that was uh, 1979? No, that would have been, 19, uh, I guess, 1981. Oh, because... I went right into the... In fact, I had to leave the Joe Wharton play to, to do the film. Oh, you were doing Joe... What was it? Uh, Entertaining Mr. Sloan, which oh. uh, they timed it just right. Uh, when it had opened on Broadway in the mid-60s, it had really sort of rubbed the critics up the wrong way, but Christopher Street was, uh, you know, wild and crazy, and uh, they were ready for black leather and bisexuality, and uh, Andy was one of the first people down to see it. And in fact, um, when his diaries were published, I was very flattered to see that he alluded to me a number of times. Was it I'm, in the beginning of the book? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you won a theater award for acting yeah, went just, off Broadway. Yeah, the year, two years before that, that was in 79. Oh, uh, I see. An so. English import called Class Enemy, which is a wonderful play, an indictment of the educational system. Well, I hear a trace of English accent, but where are you from? No, no I am, and I've, I've actually sort of progressively lost my native accent, the English, and... and oh, you are English? Yeah, that's from living here in, in California now. I'm, Totally Californian. I didn't know that. Where were in you born? In spite of myself. Where were you? Uh, I was born in, uh, in the Midlands of England, in a coal mining district. Uh, moved to London when I was very young, and then uh, ran away to New York, I guess, when I was about 17. How did you come over? I came, uh, there was a cheap discount uh, flight. Uh, I, I worked about three jobs uh, to save up the dough, and uh, came over and checked into the Y, and uh, with a copy of, you know, Jack Kerouac's on the road <laughs> under my under my arm and uh, under the other arm biographies of Brando, Dean, and Clift, and uh, was getting ready to you know take my shot at the American dream. Oh, that's great! I didn't realize that. I kept thinking you were a Midwest farm boy. Well, actually, I did. I did try to mislead people early on. My theatrical biographies were totally bogus. Were they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that part of being discovered, keep changing your persona? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> I, I guess so. Plus, I was probably running away from immigration. Who knows? What. <laughs> uh, then you went on the road with Elephant Man, or w was it on Broadway? Or Yes, uh, that, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, a winter tour of uh, Florida, uh, uh, where I met Juliet Mills, my wife. Another old friend of mine, our paths crossed. We started with Greece, yeah. and then you married Juliet, whom I'd known for a long time. Mm -hmm. And now you're two farmers together. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been doing a lot of theater. I dress for your set today. Yes, it's you wonderful. You, you, you really blend right in. Thank you. <laughs> um, you have been doing a lot of theater, though, recently. Uh, yeah, I've just, uh, we, Juliet and I just finished a play on uh, the Sunset Strip together, and um, where well, we were very aptly cast as uh, down-and-out farmers, <laughs> 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 and uh, in the Depression era, 
And um, but not she, so far from your own life. No, no. It, it, I think it was John Cassavetes who said that you know, you very often get cast in roles that that are indicative of where you're at in your life. So um, I, uh, I'm I'm glad I've come through my uh, psychotic uh, teen uh, uh, era of of, of parts. Uh, you you moved to Ohio. We have to let the uh, viewers in on what we're talking about being farmers because I saw the play mm -hmm. uh, Van T Van Tile. Yeah, Van Gene Tile. Van Tile. Yeah. And when you came out with all the cast members came out with avocados. And I thought they were such a healthy looking group. And mm. then I found mm. out mm. that it was because of uh, yeah. Mr. Caulfield. Yeah, absolutely. Avocado ice cream, quiche, avocado and eggs, you name it, we, we serve it up. But why? Why? Uh, basically to just to, so that I, I'm not totally dependent on the city for my kicks. Los Angeles. Where is your uh, farm? It's uh, just south of Santa Barbara. And, and do you spend a lot of time in L.A. or do you spend a lot of time uh, there? We, we, we come down here to uh, uh, secure employment and then uh, <laughs> hopefully get nice location jobs. Juliet's right now, as we speak in, in England, just about to set off on a, on a national tour of a Godfather Noel Coward's play. Do you think you could ever give up acting to be a farmer? Um, Is this like a fallback kind of thing? No, uh, Peter Strauss, I think he's the one who lives out in Ojai, and he, I think he cultivates oranges, and he talks about how happy he is doing just that. But the fact of the matter is that somebody's got to pay for the, the picking and the spray and the, uh, <laughs> the you know, the <laughs> property taxes. So you have to run down to the big city to, you know. Do you actually work, though, on the farm? Yeah, yeah. Because on stage, I could see what great physical condition you were in because it's a very small theater and you can't hide anything. Mm -hmm. People can see everything that's happening. And yeah, I know. Well, I hitched my jeans up nice and tight when I made my first entrance. Is that I, it? <laughs> I, uh, um, um, just, uh, just enjoy it, basically. I, you know, it, as I said, it's a, it's a respite from the industry. And uh, as far as staying in shape goes, I, uh, I, I live near the ocean, too, so I like to swim and that's my oh, bag. Dear? Yeah. Ah. Um, do you think there are a lot of things that you would have to learn? <laughs> I'm, I don't know why I'm on this farmer kick, <laughs> but to be a farmer? <laughs> you know, I'm... I, Isn't uh, this awful? <laughs> no, actually, you know, it's, it's Juliet. To some extent, uh, it's Juliet. She's the one that was, grew up on a farm uh -oh. and had this, this thing about it. I, I sort of saw myself, when, when we first saw the property, I, I guess I envisaged myself as the land baron. <laughs> I didn't realize that meant one was involved in hand-pollinating trees and all this <laughs> stuff. But once you get into it, it's kind of fun, kind of zen. I thought it was funny because I saw that Garth Brooks has a dairy, and when they go to milk the cows, he plays his music out so that the cows will have this, know their master is singing to them. <laughs> so I was wondering if there was anything you did for the avocados to know that you were there with them. Oh, I did. <laughs> Isn't that? I, I just, uh, I, I, I have a, we have a white Labrador uh, who who lies on her back, waiting for them to just drop into her mouth. My the extent of my relationship with the trees, other than <laughs> counting the bins as they go, go out, is pulling the Labrador away by her tail, just so she doesn't get any damn fatter. <laughs> um, are there any people in Hollywood that you've wanted to work with, say, in a movie mm -hmm. or on the stage? Oh, that's a that's a leading question. Yeah, a uh, number of directors. Uh, the you know the obvious guys, Scorsese and Coppola. I mean you know when I when I, when I came to New York in in the uh, early '80s, I these guys were just just it. They still are it, and and the work they do um, is is state of the art, continues to be. But there are other young directors too who are uh, younger. Hollywood has such a fixation about age. I, I, I don't want to get caught in that trap. I know. Um, God, I I know that. Uh, uh, we'll finish this interview and I'll think of a hundred of them, but there's, I saw Jonathan Kaplan's film last night, Unlawful Entry, and that guy, I, I, I saw his, when he'd made Over the Edge, I knew he, he was really... Mary Warnoff is our next guest on the show, and she did one of her very first movies with Jonathan Kaplan. Oh, really? So he's probably progressively gotten better and better and better to the point of... Sure. Well, uh, the, 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 the cameramen have become so incredible. They seem to be able to just... Uh, the, the, the work now is really exciting. 
Do you write? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the next thing I was going to say. What we need to do next is get the writing up to snuff. You know, I do have a screenplay just dying to come, uh, get, come out of me. I just got to make the time to do it. And then if you wrote something, would you write yourself into it? Uh, pr almost certainly, but uh, just, to, just to guarantee uh, some income. <laughs> what, what, what about directing? Did you ever think of doing that? Uh, that's a progressive thing. Directing is, I tell you, directing is, those guys have to know the answer to every question. They have to be so prepared. They really, it's, it's a tireless job. And then the concept of spending, the prospect rather, of spending six months in the editing room concentrating on, you know, a door creak or something like that would drive me kind of nuts. But so you don't feel that No, but maybe, the maybe down the line. But, but as, as far as, as I said, writing the screenplay goes, um, I wouldn't necessarily have to be in it. But I think I, I would, it would be that much more exciting to be involved in the story. What new projects are you uh, working on now? Um, I, if I told you where I just came from, if I just described the scene, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, One tell of us, LA's tell most us. illustrious hotels, uh, not far from here. Tell us. Uh, I was in a hotel suite. I guess we were sneaking the shot. I don't know. It seemed to be very hush-hush. There was secret knocks on the door that you had to use to get in and out. But I was doing a very bizarre scene with Jack Nicholson's daughter, Jennifer, who's making her feature film debut. And Jennifer's mother, uh, uh, Sandra Knight. Yes, Sandra Knight. And Sandra Knight is playing my mother in the film. And Jennifer and I were shooting a very, the film's called Inevitable Grace. It's about a, a guy who has a fixation about young girls who he thinks have the potential to be transformed into old time movie stars, basically so he can put them on a pedestal. It's a very strange uh, psychological, sexual trip, this picture. and. Uh, as I said, if I described the shenanigans, we were just shooting in this hotel room. It's, it's just too convoluted for words, but these various permutations of mother, wife, mother-in-law, and daughter, and it was, I didn't know quite did know. You, did you relate? Maybe that's the, the training. Let's throw them together and see how they basically, get along. Who yeah, the, takes charge? Yeah, the director just sort of basically let the camera roll and see what happens. Is that? Yeah, and there was some interesting stuff. I think the picture, quite frankly, has a big, big will initially have to take off in Europe. They'll be more open to it. But, um, you didn't have to, this wasn't like an audition, this was already a cast movie. No, I don't get things from auditioning, thank God. You don't? If I relied on my auditioning work, I, I would, uh, it's, I get offered work. Uh, why? Tell us why, because we always talk to actors who come mm. on and say we, we went to audition and the same type come, maybe three or four yeah. of the same type every audition, and uh, I just was lucky this time because I was wearing a green shirt. You know, they'll say something yeah, like that. My, my theory on it is very often the guy that gets the job is the one that the, the circle of decision makers have the least objection to. It's ah. like, it's, if you go in and, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, so much of it is, is, is about whether people like to admit it or not. It's sort of a sexual preference thing. I mean, and uh, I worked with Geraldine Page with Juliet, and she said the sex was just behind every single motivation she ever did she? You know, in, uh, related to. And uh, so the bottom line is that half the room will think you're great and the other half, you're not their type. So it's the one who's like down the middle who they go, mm, yeah, I guess, I guess I, I could see myself. <laughs> you know, a lot of women are involved in the decision making these days, or at least, at least in the casting, the uh, casting directors. But I hear that they're still, it's still kind of the grunt work that really the producer and director call the shots. Would you like to go back to Broadway and and uh, be on yeah. in a play again? Yeah, absolutely. More uh, so than making movies. What's no, your no, it's it's good to mix it up. I, I won't claim to be, you know, have a preference of one over the other. I like the, the the ultimate control that acting on stage represents. But then there's the excitement of the music and the, the you know the fantastic backdrop of and the intensity of the editing process can make, plus the, the, the wider audience you can reach through film. The so. more people you can hopefully influence with, with your ideas or at least your humor, or, you know, because I, I believe that's what I am first and foremost as an entertainer, not a great d displayer of emotion. You know, I like to touch people, but I, I, like, to, I like to try and warm their hearts first and foremost. Well, we hope uh, we had a big group of people watching us today and we hope you touched them all. I well, know we're really wonderful to come from Ohio and from the hidden little hotel room uh, behind That's the closed door. It's going on as we speak, who knows? <laughs> and we want to thank you very much for My coming. My great pleasure. Thanks, Maxwell. Thanks, John. We'll be back 
with Mary Warnoff just after the break. I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back. Mary Warnoff's been patiently waiting in the green room to tell us everything about her life, <laughs> even <laughs> about her painting life, about her acting life. She brought a painting uh, to put on the set, so we'll be talking about that. While she was going to Cornell University getting her BFA, she fell under the Warhol spell and made some movies just for Andy. After Chelsea Girls, her mother snipped her career in the bud, or nipped it, or whatever you want to say. Her mother was there doing it. Not to be held back, Mary was the darling of Off Off Broadway. Then she went to Lincoln Center, where Joseph Papp put her in the Boom Boom Room. She won a New York Theatre World Award, the same as Maxwell, same type of award, for Most Promising Actress. The lead in ABC's soap, Somerset, took her to the world of the low-budget film. Are you surprised, Mary, that I'm I know shocked. all of this? I'm <laughs> Mary worked in so many low-budget films that Playboy called her the queen of the bees. The biggest low-budget film she made, however, was Eating Raul. There was no budget. <laughs> so tell us about it. How did you work with no budget? <laughs> well, I... Uh did my costume changes in a phone booth. I <laughs> <laughs> Superman style? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we, uh, it, first of all, I have to say that one thing is great. Everybody worked together because there was no money. And I remember the second night, <laughs> Paul figured out that there wasn't going to be any money. And he made this speech about how he had no money to pay anybody and anybody could go home that wanted to. And of course, nobody went home. Paul Bartell. Paul who? Bartell. And uh, from then on, the movie uh, just fed itself. We worked uh, maybe a weekend, and then I wouldn't hear from them for uh, two months. <laughs> and then we'd work another weekend, and that was it. The movie was over. And then four months later, we'd work for maybe a week. They got film from, uh, they got film from uh, a movie in Africa uh, where the cans had rusted and they were afraid to use the film. So every time we shot something, we thought that it would not turn out. We also thought it would not turn out because we were, we were what do you call it, you know, developing it in a porno lab. <laughs> it didn't cost any money. Did you get anything, any porno flicks of No, inserted? no, no, no. They were really good <laughs> and we never had a problem. It was amazing. But um, how, how did they work with, with no money? It took them a year. Did, did well, they one a of year? The, yes, yes. It took him a year <coughs> to shoot something like 28 days of shooting. <laughs> it was, um, another way that we worked without any money is Paul's parents, they'd had a little money. He, Paul asked his parents to sell their house <laughs> and give him some money. <laughs> and they actually did it? Yes, they did. And they became rich. Oh, because the film yeah. was such a success? It did very well. And then did he go off and pay his people? Yes, he did. He came back and he paid everybody. Oh, that was nice. Yeah. You're also, besides being known as the queen of the bees, I never quite realized that the bees were low budget. I always thought they were like the second film no, of no, the matinee. No. <laughs> no, well, yes, but it's just that the second film of the matinee <laughs> was the low budget film. It's like everybody would come to see the A movie and then they'd be too lazy to get up and leave and they'd watch the B movie. But if just the B movie was playing, they would never go see it. Oh, that's so. <laughs> uh, you're also known as a cult star. This is true. But do you mind that kind of uh, moniker? It, it's very bizarre. I do not know what it means, really. I mean, a cult star is, is someone who has done movies that are so bizarre that uh, people have made an extra category for them and they just call it cult, and you don't really know what it is. I mean, like, I have been met in the street by people, and they go, oh, wow, you're Mary Warnoff. And I go, yes. <laughs> and they go, well, uh, I just saw a movie of yours. It was, uh, and then they name a movie. And I go, I'm so sorry you had to see that. It is one of the worst movies in the world. I'm really, really sorry. And then they go, well, we really liked it. We watched it five times. <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
<laughs> and what, what movie would that have been? What movie I can't do you think is that. so awful? Tell us what. No, I can't. I can't. That's that very was unfair. Such a list of movies. <laughs> I don't know how many movies did you make? I've made a lot. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot. I went down and I thought, well, I can't even start naming these movies or the plays. I mean, you were oh, in no. the de in uh, the plays. I remember because you have to work a long time on the plays. Women behind bars. Yes, I was in the original. I, c I couldn't believe that. And you worked with Tom. I'm very Iron. old. I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've mean, i been around forever. You started. Yeah. Early started, I, I started guess. really young. <laughs> <laughs> when you were really young? No, no, no. I started right after Cornell. You know, I just, I just started. And uh, What were you actually at Cornell for? What were you going to be when you grew up? Art. I was going to be uh, an artist. Have you grown up? Um, yeah, I have. I've grown up a lot of times. I, <laughs> um, my art career I do, and then uh, I phase out of it, and then I go into it again. And um, but we can't call art cult. I mean, that's not like no. a, a cult thing. No. Uh, do you do you try to break away from that cult label? Yeah. I mean, you know, I did a day at Dick Tracy. That's not too cult. Um, you know, I try and break away. My agent always sends me out for the finest and the best. Um, and who and I do actually do things that, are, I mean, you know, like uh, Class Struggle in Beverly Hills was not a cult movie. I mean, I have all those, you know, the movie I did with Dreyfus was not a cult movie, Let It Ride. I mean, I have all of these other movies that are not cult. But for some reason, when I walk down the street, everybody remembers these horrendous movies that they are very fond of. And but, but they're independent films. I just saw you in an independent film recently called The Living End. That's the best movie. This guy is so great. <laughs> this guy, us. No, this guy is really a genius. He shot with literally no money. I mean, I walked out on the set. Well, the set was in, but there were no lights. He <laughs> shot without any lights. So I this is God. really going back to low budget. <laughs> yes. Independent Well, no, film. no. I have a fondness for low budget. I will always go back to it. I have a theory, especially with comedy, that uh, a lot of money makes it not too funny. Um, when you do really low budget stuff, for some reason uh, you get this, it's a way that I'm used to working, you get this core of stuff that's really good. Do you also feel like you can do what you want to do more or less than having like a $40,000 a day well, studio telling you what to do? Uh, but the whole thing is, is when they have $40,000 and they tell you what to do, they're usually right. Oh, I They see. have like this incredible scheme that you have no knowledge of. I mean, and they've got all this money pumping in for it and you usually have to do <coughs> what they do. But when they don't have a scheme is when they have no money and you do get to do what you want to do and it's wonderful. But you like, like to do that. There's this one movie, there was this one <laughs> movie that I did not want to do because it was the same old role. It was the role of this very mean, nasty nurse. And I'm so tired of this role. So I said, well, fine, you know, I will do it if you let me play it as a man. And they said, oh, okay, we really don't want you to, but since we're not paying you, what can we do? And so I put on <laughs> this mustache. I was the greatest guy. I looked like this really hot sort of Puerto Rican guy. Oh. <laughs> what did you do with your hair? I had a wig. Ah, uh, slick back. Yes, with a jelly roll. Oh, so that so you do get to do what you want. Who would hire me to play a guy? Nobody. You're tall this enough. This is the only. This is the only. <laughs> it was so great. <laughs> did you have a, a hard time shaking that um, label in the Warhol movies of being a lesbian? Because I think Andy was always just willing to do anything that would stick a knife in someone and make them do something that was he, against what they were. He, um, well, I did have a hard time. It wasn't, I didn't have a hard time with the lesbian part of it. I don't think they're really um, looked down on in the business. I had a hard time with the fact that I worked with Warhol. They hated Is that. Is that right? They hated that. They just hated that. That was not, that was anti-film for some reason. That was, uh, you know, against what they were. Uh, so and therefore, I, was I wasn't an actress. I was maybe this kind of freak that didn't know anything about acting, although I got the Theatre World Award, but I was this kind of freak that was against acting, and they, it was too rambunctious for them. They didn't want to use it. You were in uh, a couple of movies, going back to the bees, <laughs> Silent Night, Bloody Silent Night, Night, and Sugar Bloody Cookies. Night. Directed <laughs> by a husband, by yes. your hu a, not a husband, but your husband. Uh. Now, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> well, I married him. I did a film with him in Italy, and I thought he was great, and I married him, and he wanted to continue his film career. And <laughs> I 
So <laughs> he couldn't get anything but these terrible movies. And then he finally did Sugar Cookies. And that was kind of horrible because, you know, here I was married to this guy. And I thought, well, you know, he's writing this movie and he, he's writing me a role and I'll do it. And I did do it, but he wrote me the role of a lesbian. I mean, this oh, man again? is married again? to me. <laughs> yes, it was terrible. So was that the end of the marriage? <laughs> Almost. It, it did it last much <laughs> longer than that? No. Ah. Did you want to be an actress or a painter? Oh, I always wanted to be an artist. So um, tell us, we have a painting well, you let me just tell okay. you that I always thought that um, that acting was uh, vain, ah. and that it wasn't intellectual, and it wasn't. Um, but you see, there's one great thing about acting: it pays the bills. So I'm an actress first. Is I it mean, easier? Easier than what? Painting? No, it's just different. So you didn't cho choose the easiest way? No, 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 no. Painting's really lonely, um, and acting you work with people. So that's good, but in acting you don't really do what you, it's, you don't own what, what you do is part of something, whereas painting, that's mine. But the thing is when you say you go out as an actress and you're there and you're, you know, they see you and you're doing mm. something, painting I think is putting yourself more on the line. You talk about being alone, painting, it's you, and then you it have is. to bring it out and let someone see it. You know, and you're judged. I mean, you're just laying there bare open. Don't no, you think? I, no, I agree. Because when someone looks at my paintings, um, I get, uh, I don't get upset, but I get more, um, I get more worried or more moved or more, uh, whereas if someone looks at my acting, I mean, you know, hey, you don't like it? Oh, that's fine. I don't <laughs> care. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. You're like really on the line. Yeah. Do you have, in a gallery show, you, you can't really... I get really nervous in gallery shows. So you had shows in New York, because I came to one of your shows in New York. So do we have any shows coming up? Well, right now my paintings are at Trump's, which is a restaurant that shows art. Right. Show a but lot are of you going to be painting for any place in New York? Uh, not that I know of. Well, not then we're going to have the Mary Warnoff show right here on the Joan Quinn show. <laughs> and we're going to say goodbye to Mary and thank her for coming on and bringing her painting. And uh, let's uh, look at your art on our show. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs> goodbye. Thanks for being on Joan Quinn, et cetera, and we'll see you next time.